Gospel Tangents is supported by users like you. Please support us at gospeltangents.com or on Patreon. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology, and first daily Mormon history podcast. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to continue our conversation with Dr. Ryan Cragen. He's a sociologist from the University of Tampa, and we're going to talk about how other churches track membership and also the rise of the nuns. Especially in Utah, does that uh, mean LDS people? We'll talk about that more in just a minute. Check it out. Okay. Yeah. So I was talking to Christina Rossetti. Do you know Christina? I have never met her, I don't think, but I know her name. Yeah. So so she teaches at Utah Tech. Yep. Just got engaged, by the oh, way. Congratulations. <laughs> She's probably moving to Canada. Her boyfriend's in Canada. He's okay. an Anglican priest or something oh, like that. Fun. Okay. So I hope we don't lose her, but I will just put in a quick plug. The Juanita Brooks Conference in April. Yep. We are going to go to Short Creek. <laughs> Last year we went to Mountain Meadows. Nice. Um, so anyway, put that on your calendar. Um, and I don't know if Juanita will, or if Christina will do that again. Right. But one of the things... When I talked with her, is mm-hmm. she says, well, you've got 16 million Mormons. And I kind of hesitated, mm-hmm. well. And she says, just take it. She says, nobody does that. We've got a billion Catholics. She's converted <laughs> Catholic. Right. And nobody says, well, there's really only 500 million. <laughs> I do, but n- most people don't. Right? Okay. Yeah, so when I see the 17 million you know, members of the church or whatever, I immediately look at a paper that my buddy, who's a co-author on this, Rick Phillips, wrote, where he showed using census data. Because there are a number of countries around the world where they ask your religious affiliation on the census, right? Um, Brazil is one of those. And so what he showed in his study, which was published in like 2004, I think, so it's you know it's 20 years ago, um, the LDS Church was reporting like 1.4, 1.3 million members in Brazil, but on the census, it was 300,000. Okay. So of those 17 million... One million are people who were baptized in Brazil, right, but no longer identify as Mormon. And the same actually is true in Mexico. It's like 1.3, 1.4 again, and a million of them don't even identify as Mormon, right? So, yeah, when they say 17 million, I just laugh at those numbers. I mean, to be honest, like everybody knows those numbers are wildly inflated. They're a joke. What about the Catholics? Um, Theirs is a little trickier, right, because, yeah, we can compare census data, but the Catholic Church— does not kind of bet everything on their numbers. They know they're big, right? They're huge. But they don't kind of push this idea out there that it's like, we are growing and therefore we're true, right? And I know the church doesn't emphasize that as much, but come on. Growing up when we did, this was a huge part of the rhetoric, right? It's like, if we weren't God's church, then why would we be growing, right? And today they're not really growing, right? They might be offsetting the losses, that they have from people leaving the church by the converts and, you know, the new kids coming up. But honestly, the LDS church is like barely treading water in my, in my take at this point. Right. And if we look at Catholics, they just don't have to do the same thing. Plus they don't report their actual numbers. Right. So find me the report of the Catholic church where it's like, we have the exact number of members in this County. Right. They just don't do it. They don't care as much about this. The LDS church is very particular about their numbers. So it's the smaller groups who care a lot about this. Jehovah's Witnesses do the same thing, though their numbers are really weird. Um, And then Seventh-day Adventists, but they actually clean their roles. So of the three groups, the one that's actually the most uh, most accurate representation of those who actually self-identify is Seventh-day Adventists. Okay. Um, And it's because they do go through and say like, hey, these people aren't attending. We can't find them. They're out. They're done. Jehovah's Witnesses underreport, right? So they have more people who identify, but they don't count them because they're not doing their publishing. So they've got to do a certain amount of time, which they actually just got rid of that requirement. But so they would only report the publishers, not all the people who identified. So they're actually on the other end. So Jehovah's Witnesses underreport, Mormons wildly overreport, and Seventh day Adventists are kind of right in the middle. <laughs> and then other religions, you know, might report some numbers. But yeah, the numbers are, are weird when you get into the details. Okay, because that's that is my question. Mm-hmm. How do LDS compare to Pentecostals, Baptists, and those sorts of things? But mm-hmm. you say they just don't report numbers. Uh, like Pentecostalism is impossible, right? So that one is only going to be self-report because they're a completely kind of distributed uh, entity. There isn't a top-down hierarchical organization, right? The Catholic Church you could probably get at some of those numbers. They might have some of them. But it's really tricky because they're not as meticulous at tracking people down, right? I mean, 
You can be Catholic and go up to any Catholic church on any given Sunday and no one's going to care, right? They don't use the same very clear geographic kind of system to track people that's just like, hey, go to church. We'd love for you to go to church, right? Wherever you are, go to church. Um, but Pentecostalism is non-hierarchical, right? So who do they report their numbers to? They don't have to report their numbers to anybody. Anybody, you, Rick, tomorrow you could say, I am a Pentecostal pastor and set up a church right down the street and no Pentecostal is going to challenge you right? That's just the nature you of sure? the religion. A hundred percent, right? Because the nature of the religion is if you feel called, you're a pastor. There's no training, right? There's no, like, you don't have to go to, um, you know, to get a degree in divinity or something like that to set up as a Pentecostal pastor. You could do that tomorrow. Well, it's funny. I mentioned Steve Pineacre. I don't know if you know him. I subscribe to something on Facebook where he kind of has a, I don't know, he's got something on Facebook. Yeah. So Steve came out to Utah about three weeks ago for a Bickertonite baptism. Oh. And the Bickertonites, I guess I should give a brief history, <laughs> Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young excommunicated each other. Sidney started a new church in Pittsburgh, basically. Um, it kind of fell apart. A guy by the name of William Bickerton uh, picked up the pieces, became, so they're, they think Joseph Smith was the first prophet, Sidney Rigdon was second, William Bickerton was third. And so they're very Pentecostal. Right. Uh, they just had their first baptism in Utah in December. Steve came out here because they believe in the Book of Mormon. They do not believe in the Doctrine and Covenants. Sure. Um, and so <laughs> Steve got all kinds of crap because Steve claims to be an evangelical. Okay. Um, and all these evangelicals came out of the woodwork were like, Steve, you're not an evangelical. You support a Book of Mormon church. They're a cult. They're terrible. They're devil worshipers. You know, like, just let them have it. Like, you don't meet the evangelical cred. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and S Steve was funny because he was like, what, how should I respond? And I'm like, we've been fighting this for 200 years. We don't have any good answers. <laughs> um, yeah. It, I've, I've had these debates a number of times, right? From a sociologist standpoint, if I was doing survey collection and Steve, you know, if we called him or we asked him, you know, online, what is your religious identification? If he said evangelical, he's evangelical, right? It's all self-report. You can get into these arguments, right? And people have been doing it for centuries, millennia, right? Of like, who are the true evangelicals? Effectively, they're just playing a big game of the no true Scotsman fallacy. I don't know if you're familiar with that fallacy, right? Go ahead and say it. Yeah, so... Uh, the basic idea is that you it's a moving the goalpost fallacy, right? That you're basically saying like, oh, well, only true evangelicals believe this. So you may say you're evangelical, but you're not actually evangelical because only the true ones do this, right? And of course, you can move that all the time. Uh, I remember the first time this came up in one of my classes, we were talking about religion-inspired terrorism. And of course, teaching in the U.S., I didn't have any Muslim students in my class. So I point out, you know, the very obvious ones are like some Muslim inspired terrorism. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. And then I say, oh, and then there was that bombing during the Atlanta, Atlanta Olympics in the 1996 or whatever. And I was like, and that was a Christian. They're like, well, he wasn't a true Christian. And I was like, of course he's a true Christian, right? You don't get to rule somebody out because they're a bad member of your faith, right? That's just not how this works. But like, well, I get to determine, no, you don't determine who the Christians are. You don't determine who the Mormons are, the evangelicals. That's the no true Scotsman fallacy, right? Only the people who I like get to be part of my religion. Everybody else gets ruled out. I'm like, that's, sorry, that's not the way it works, right? <laughs> so it sounds very much like that's the situation he's in. It's like, oh, true evangelicals do this. Yeah. They Identify hate Mormons. How you want. Yeah. Identify how you want. I if you're care. a true evangelical, you hate Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> it's not how it works. Sorry, evangelicals. It's not how it works. Do you have any sense, going back to Christina, mm -hmm. you know, because I think, what is the number? Isn't it 1.3 billion Catholics in the world? Something Do you have like any that. sense for how many are really Catholics, self identified right. Catholics? Self identified. Sociological yeah, point of view? Yeah. Um, it's tricky. Uh, you know, Pew probably has the best data on that. They've spent a lot of time trying to estimate this. I think their current number is close to a billion, right? Somewhere around there. And that would probably be pretty close to self-identification. Now, of course, if you dig into attendance stuff, right? So how engaged they are, how important it is, how closely they adhere to the orthodoxy, that's going to drop 
pretty precipitously, right? So yeah, I mean, it, it's not hard for people to say, yeah, I'm Catholic, right? And when was the last time you went to church? Well, 30 years ago, right? I still remember I was in a, a cab in uh, Buenos Aires. I was doing some research down there on atheists in, in Argentina. Got in a cab, you know, and I do speak enough Spanish. It's, I served my mission in Costa Rica, but um, we were having a conversation and he's like, oh, you study religion? I was like, yeah. He says, I, I'm Catholic. And I was like, oh, that's great. And he says, but I haven't been to church in 40 years. And I was like, why do you still identify as Catholic? Right. Right? It's just a cultural thing, right? We still see the same thing in Scandinavia. So there are a lot of people in Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, depends on how you want to count Scandinavia, right? Um, where they say like, oh, yeah, I'm part of the state church, which a lot of them are kind of separating the state church out. Like, okay, but do you believe in God? No. Why would I believe in God, right? I'm Norwegian, therefore I'm Lutheran, right? They, they link those two together as though that is part of their identity, but they don't incorporate any of the beliefs or the behaviors, right? So if, for many of them, they're like, oh, Norwegians are Lutheran. That's, that is what it means to be Norwegian, so they just link them but they don't believe any of the things, right? So the same is true. Like, I was raised Catholic, so I'm Catholic. Do you believe in any of it? No, no, uh-uh. I mean, we know this, right? So some of the numbers are fascinating. More than 70%, more than 60%, I'll, I'll hedge my bets here, of Americans think that Catholic priests should be allowed to get married. They also, it's close to 70% think you I should- I even told Christina that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, isn't that amazing? Uh, something like 70% think that women should be allowed to use birth control. Both of those run absolutely counter to what the Catholic Church teaches, right? Our current president, Joe Biden, not in favor of abortion, but in favor of birth control and abortion access, right? This is why a lot of the Catholic bishops are like, he should be excommunicated. And I'm like, come on, right? Like, what does it mean to be Catholic, right? And that's actually a tricky one because the Catholic Church has much looser criteria for how you can remain a member of the church than, say, Mormons, right? Uh, though the LDS church, I think has backed off quite a bit in excommunicating people because the bad PR that comes with that, it's just, it's really dangerous these days. So they're willing to let more people stay until it becomes a real problem. Right. And when you get a Kate Kelly or a John DeLynn who are making waves, then it's time to go in and, and kick them out. But if, you know, Joe Blow down the street is like, I don't believe that they're just like, whatever, you know, as long as he's not influencing a lot of people, they don't care anymore. <laughs> it's all PR. Well, and that's. That was the question I wanted to ask you next, because mm -hmm. you talked about the, well, I'm Catholic or I'm Lutheran, but I don't ever go. Do we see the same phenomena in the LDS church? Yeah, but not to the same degree, which is kind of interesting. So um, members of the LDS church are more likely to be engaged, right, than a lot of other religions. So certainly with Catholics, I mean, the vast majority of Catholics are, you know, Christmas, Easter Catholics. They rarely go. They don't go a lot. Uh, for people who still identify as members of the church, they're particularly like, I mean, we, we've had these numbers for quite a while. They're more likely to attend, right? So there are some who clearly don't, but still identify. Um, as a percentage, they give more money to their religion than any other religious group in the U.S. There might be two exceptions that are close. Hindus and Jews actually are pretty close. But otherwise, I mean, they give way more. Uh, on average, it's about 7%. So not all Mormons are good tithe payers, but it's about 7% of their money that they're giving, right? Uh, which is actually pretty surprising, right? The, when most people say, I'm a member of the church, they actually mean like they hold a lot of the beliefs. They do attend. They do a lot of it. And it's not all of them, but quite a few. So they're higher than, say, Episcopalians and a lot of other groups. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Ryan Cragen from the University of Tampa. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about whether there was a third great awakening and why churches grow in the global south. Um, he said that there's an arise in people who are like into astrology and new age religion. Do you agree with that? No, not at all. <laughs> uh, sorry, Matt. I uh, love Matt. Nice guy. Uh, I think he's wrong on that. Thanks for listening, and I hope you to continue to enjoy Gospel Tangents. Consider becoming a Patreon or go to gospeltangents.com slash shop, and you can get a cool tie, a hat, or even a nice mug. You can also get a sweatshirt, so check it out at gospeltangents.com slash shop.